Everyone worships. Every moment of our lives, we all worship. Worship isn't confined to sanctuaries and temples, tabernacles and cathedrals. It doesn't merely consist of the melodies we make, the prayers we pray, and the lifting of hands. Worship is much more. Worship looks like three words. Trust, time, treasure. Trust, what do you hope will hold you when all else fails? Storms will come and only a firm foundation will keep us standing. Time, what are you giving your minutes, days, and years to? Our lives are a vapor, gone in a moment. Treasure, what will you empty your pockets for? Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Everyone worships, every moment of our lives, but only Jesus is worthy of all worship. Trust, build your life on Jesus, the solid rock, the firm foundation, the safe refuge. Time, we are here today and gone tomorrow. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Treasure, the Prince of Heaven purchased our redemption and richly provides our needs. Jesus gives us someone worth worshiping. Trust, time, treasure. Give it all to Jesus. Worship Jesus.
obviously, oh, well, that's great. This is obviously something that is not wanted to happen. So as we continue to press on and we continue to move in the anointing that, that God's placed over this service, just think like the enemy has quite literally now tried everything to stop it. So it is quite apparent that this is supposed to happen. This is supposed to be a right now moment for someone in here. And this is going to be a freedom call for you. Your mercy never fails me, and all my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Oh, I will 
A few weeks ago, our family stood in Tennessee as we were bidding farewell to Valerie's father, and I've been a part of their family for 43 years. Didn't know what to say. They'd asked me to do the funeral service, and that was an honor, but it was terrifying. But when we stood at the graveside, this song came to my heart. And I just sat there and looked at those flowers that I knew very quickly would fade away. And I said, God, all our lives you have been faithful. How many of you can say that tonight? All 
my life. And he's been faithful to us. He's been faithful to us. I said he's been faithful to us. He is a faithful God. Amanda, I want you to sing that first verse. And then when we get to the chorus, I want to do it a cappella. But sing that first verse again. I want you to think about the faithfulness of God and how he's been faithful to you. Amen. sing it church and hold my supernatural presence of the Holy Spirit here tonight. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated. I want you to do me a favor. If you are a pastor of one of our area churches, would you stand? If you're a lead pastor, would you stand? We want to welcome you. All our lead pastors, would you stand? Thank you. Thank you. One, two, three. I think we have four here, four pastors. What we want to do is um, our, our church wants to bless you with one of these kingdom packets. We're going to pay for those for you. And I understand Brother Hank Williams already went back there and bought one. She's going to bring you the money and, and, and uh, refund you. We want to be a blessing to you tonight because we love you. I love each of you. You're dear to me dear to me. I've known Hank Williams since we were about 13. <laughs> we took a trip to New Orleans one time and we will never go back. I mean, we will never forget it. <laughs> Amen. I love, I love you, Brother Salyers. I love you. I love each of you guys. You guys are just awesome men and women of God. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm going to ask you to prepare your very best offering as our ushers come. And we're going to ask you in just a moment to bring your offerings to the front. But I want you to think about this. Our church has been able to do millions of dollars worth of debt-free ministry over the last 14 years because we are givers. We are givers. And I believe that, and I don't, I don't know if Pastor Tony will remember this. I've often shared this story, but many, many years ago when we were just starting to pastor a little church, 
I went to camp meeting. That's where all the churches gather. And back then it was in Canton, Ohio. And we had about $50 to cover our expenses for the week, our food. And um, Pastor Tony got up and received an offering. And he challenged us to give in faith. I had never heard that before. I was 25, 26 years old. I had never heard that message before. I'd always heard that you just barely get by. And, and when he was speaking, I looked over at my wife and she immediately started shaking her head like this. She said, we've got to eat the rest of this week. We had five days of camp meeting left. And he said something so, it changed my life. He said, just trust God's word. And I remember thinking, God, we're just, we're just, our church is just broke. We're just barely making it, but I'm going to trust you. And I walked up there to the offering and I gave that last $50 that we had. We had no idea how we were going to eat the rest of the week at camp meeting or even how we were going to get gas to get home. And it was one of those big offerings for me. I was scared. I was nervous. If you can give big and it doesn't challenge you, then you're not giving big enough. We gave everything that we had, but what we did not know that moment, that that offering would change our lives forever. Went back to the seat and sat down, and Valerie, in all her wisdom back then as a 23-year-old, she said, I hope you know what you're doing. I said, we're just going to trust God's word. Right after the offering and everyone settled down, I'm telling you this, to get you to trust God's word. An usher came over and tapped me on the shoulder and said, are you Rodney Mullins? And I said, yes, I am. So there's a lady standing back in the back of the sanctuary. Said, while the offering was going on, God spoke to her heart and said, bless Rodney Mullins with this money. And he handed me a $100 bill. It was less than five minutes from the moment we stepped out in faith. I was just so overwhelmed. I was crying so loud. I went back to the restroom because I, I had to try to control myself. I came out of the restroom, and there was a pastor there. He said, God told me to bless you with this, and he gave me $50. I'm telling you, Val will verify this. Every meal that week, somebody came up and said, we want to take you out and buy your dinner, your breakfast, your lunch. Every meal. When we were walking out the last day of that camp meeting, the overseer came up to me and said, Lord told me to bless you and buy your gas for the week. And he gave me another $100. We went home with a new revelation about God's economics. Not man's economics, but God's economics. And we have never gone without from that moment to this day. Did you hear me? You're not hearing me. We have never gone without from that moment to this day. It was, a, it was a reality of God's kingdom that I had never seen before. That's why, that's why this church has paid for several funerals. That's why this church has bought funeral plots for people. That's why this church has, has given to churches around this community. That's why we give money all over the place because we know that this is a kingdom and people always say you can't outgive God it has really that's a good saying but it's much deeper than that when you just get the reality of the kingdom economics amen how many of you was carried through by kingdom economics when 2020 came along in 22, 23, 24. People said, how did your church survive during that time? We were already prepared. We had already given. We had already planted seed. And I want to tell you, our church had more income during COVID come into this church than we had at any other time. 
Matter of fact, we had about $70,000 excess come in. All-time tithe records were broken during COVID. Why? Because our dependence is not on man's economy. Would you stand with me tonight? Oh. Our church is going to invest and plant seed in, in Pastor Tony's ministry. Um, and I'll be up in just a moment after this song and, and introduce him to you. But I want you to plant seed. Amen. I want you to plant seed. Father, we just thank you right now for the revelation that Pastor Tony and Shirley Scott invested in us so many years ago, 40 years ago. The revelation that changed our lives forever. All my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so, so good. Today, God, I'm reminded of your blessings. I'm reminded of your covenant. I'm reminded of how you have opened up the windows of heaven and poured out blessings that Val and I are unable to contain. I want that for every person here tonight, Lord. So I pray, Lord, for the same revelation I received when I was just 25 years old that has carried me through all these years for these folks to receive that same revelation in their giving tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you step out, bring your offerings to the ushers? They're going to be standing here waiting to serve you. so good, so very, very good. So I shared with you way back in 1985, we received a revelation that was shared with us from Pastor Tony's heart. Um, Val spent a lot of her childhood at, at Pastor Tony's church, and um, I've lived under that shadow for 40 years, you know. Um, Sometimes I say, I'll give you $100 if you tell me I'm your favorite. But we have always loved Pastor Tony, always loved his ministry. We've always loved his voice. He's not just a mentor to many, many people, but he's a father of the faith. And when God gives him a revelation, it's more than just for his local church. It's for the body of Christ. He has, he has spoken this word um, on international television. He's spoken this word to the pastors of the Church of God. And I, I wanted to bring him here and share with you. I believe you're going to be blessed tonight. But not only that, I believe you're going to receive revelation. How many of you know the value of revelation? And we're living in a season where we need revelation. Um, Pastor Tony, thank you for being here with us tonight. I love this man dearly. Um, when I am hungry, when I'm thirsty, when I'm in need of a word, 
we often go home on Sunday afternoons and we'll put Pastor Tony right on our television screen and we get fed and we get blessed. He's got a powerful social network um, profile that you, you want to get involved in and watch his teaching. I was watching one today. I got a notice on my phone every time he's on. It pops up, and I get to enjoy the word that he shares. But I know you're going to be blessed. I want you to make welcome to the great city of Levittsburg, Ohio, the metropolitan area. Bishop Tony Scott, as he comes to share a word of truth with us. Would you give that hand to Jesus? Let me see. Let me hear it. Come on. And then I know all of you could use some more exercise, so would you all stand up one more time? Look at somebody and say, you need this. You're burning more calories by standing than when you're sitting, so if you stood the whole service, you could go eat tonight. I love Rodney and I love Valerie. I, I think of all the young couples that... Valerie came up in our church. He lived in the Toledo area, but I, I don't know of any couple that I have admired through the years more so than I've admired them. You are blessed to have this couple as your pastors. When I came to Toledo in, in 1974, I was nine or 12 or something. I'm not good with numbers. We didn't have an organ player. And someone said to me, Rachel can play the organ. And I said, well, who is Rachel? And they said, she's right back there. So I went back and I said, Rachel, I hear you play the organ. She, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not no, nowhere near good enough to play the organ in church. I said, I think tonight God wants you to become our organ player. And she did. She became our organ player. Smith family were very precious to us during those years. And God used them, used her dad as well in the church. He was playing music in the bars, and I, I went out to get him and bring him in. And he told me that he picked up a little money playing. I told him God was going to bless him if he would leave the bar and come to church. And he did, but he didn't get saved. And so one Sunday night, I looked back and I said, Ted Smith, this is your night. I'll never forget that night as long as I live. Sitting on the back seat, and he walked down the aisle and gave his heart to Jesus. God is good. He's good. How many of you have been praying a prayer and, and you've really gotten in earnest with God? You focus, but the prayer hasn't been answered. Just... Would you just lift your hand? I, I've been praying this prayer, and, and keep your hand up. I, I've been praying, and, and the prayer hasn't been answered. I, I, I wanna, I'm going to share a truth with you tonight, and I want you to hear this because it's really important. There is a courtroom in heaven, the court of heaven, and God is the judge, and Jesus Christ is our defense attorney. He's called the advocate. That means defense attorney. You can go into the courtroom of heaven through the kingdom of the Almighty God and have Jesus Christ represent your request to the Father. And the last time I checked was just a few minutes ago. He has never lost a case. He's won every case. I, I would like nothing more than for you to walk out of here tonight with an answer to your prayer. I, I really believe this. We shouldn't just come together on a Friday night and, and have a worship service, a kingdom night, but we should walk out of here having heard from God. Are you ready to hear from God? Would you like to hear from God? I want to hear the word of the Lord. I want God to speak to me. Every morning of my life, seven days a week, no matter where I'm at in the world, I get up at 5.15, I get my clothes on, I go to the church if I'm in town, sometimes it's in a hotel room somewhere, and I spend the first hour of my day in prayer. The reason I do that is I don't ever want to go through a day without having first given God a chance to speak to me about that day. 
because I don't know what's going to happen that day. I came in for a counseling session on Wednesday with a family to have a 14-year-old girl tell me that she had been raped by her grandfather for five years. Her stepfather had beaten her with a belt. She didn't believe in God, and the reason she didn't believe in God is, is if there is a God, how could that happen to me? Why is our world so dark? Why are we as a nation somehow so far turned away from God that our federal government has decided that there should be no boys and girls bathrooms in our schools? It's getting dark in America. Yeah, I know we had an election, and I know people say things are about to turn around. You know something? A president can't turn this nation around. A party can't turn this nation around. The Senate can't do it. The House of Representatives. Let me tell you what we need. We need a move of the Holy Spirit of the Almighty God. I I want you to look at this verse of Scripture with me, and I want them to put it on the screens. Yeah, this one behind me. Wow, that's a biggie. This is Mark 1 and 15. This is Jesus Christ speaking. Mark's gospel is the oldest gospel in the New Testament. The other guys borrowed from Mark. Mark and Peter were very close and they shared things. But Mark is the original writer in the New Testament. This is Jesus Christ speaking. This is the literal translation from Greek into English. Comes right out of the Greek language. Read it out loud with me. And saying the appointed period of time is fulfilled, completed, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, have a change of mind, which issues in regret for past sins and in change of conduct for the better, and believe, trust in, rely on, and adhere to the good news of the gospel. Let me tell you what Jesus says with this. I am here and I'm the difference maker and the kingdom can be the difference maker in your life. In essence, he said, a new day has now dawned. I want you to know that day is still dawning because he came to bring it. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, speak to us this night. Oh God, by the power of your word and of your Holy Spirit, breathe upon this place. Hear and answer prayers of your people, Father. Speak words of encouragement, uplifting God. Cause people to walk out of here with a holy boldness, Father. To go out and witness to our world about Jesus, we pray this in Jesus' name and amen. You may be seated. I don't spend a lot of time promoting things, but there are three books out there that, four books actually, that we put into a pack at $75, but you can have it for $50 because I won't get invited back if I don't give you a Rodney Mullen special. So I cut the price, $25. I'd give it to you, but I'm not as wealthy as some other people in the ministry. I've given away just about as many books as I've sold because I want people to hear the message. My wife and I wrote this book before she went to heaven. She wrote her part, and then I wrote my part afterwards. One plus one equals one. I would challenge every couple to read the book and look at what God says about oneness and then go out and live it. I will tell you there is a warning on the back of the book, it says right in the middle, and I'll read you the warning. Many couples will experience an increase in passionate, intimate sexual love once they read and apply the principles of this book. I won't say anything else about that, just you can take that as a word given to you. This is a book that will help you become who God made you to be because all of us are more than we have become. You will never arrive in this life. You are on a journey. 
until the day you die, you will be experiencing more and more a part of who you actually are. And this is the latest book on the kingdom of God, living the fourth dimension. Many years ago, Lester Sumrall looked at me across my desk. He was one of the greatest men of God I'd ever met in my life. And he said to me, understand the kingdom and understand covenant. That was back in 1984. And I set my heart to understand the kingdom of God and understand covenant because you see, Jesus only had one message. The only message Jesus preached was the message of the kingdom. You can look at any red letter teaching Bible you can find and everything he taught was about his kingdom. He came to give to us a kingdom. And he said, when you pray, here's how I want you to pray. I want you to pray. I want you to look up to the heavenly father and I want you to pray and seek first, say first. first. I want you to seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. Secondly, he said, when you pray, Pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. So in the prayer that he wants us to pray, it's all about the kingdom. And there is a manifestation of the kingdom. And one of the challenges that you and I have in our country, this country called America, is that in third world countries, they've been preaching on the kingdom for years. And may I just tell you, the dead are raised in some of those countries Cancers fall off in services. The lame get up and walk. The blind see. The people who can't hear get their hearing back. I'm just trying to tell you there's something about the message of the kingdom that we've missed. And we need to understand the message of the kingdom. And so what do I call it? I call it our highest life. The highest life you can live on this earth is a kingdom life. Understanding the word of the kingdom of God. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 5, I would point out to you this verse because it's so significant in the day in which we're living. Read it out loud with me. And have felt how good the word of God is and the mighty powers of the age and world to come. In essence, he is telling us that when Jesus came, heaven invaded earth, the kingdom came to earth. And the things that are going on in heaven can go on down here on the earth because of this. There's been an overlap. Have felt how good it is, the word of God is, and the mighty powers of the kingdom to come. I want to show you just a few slides about where we are today. I want you to see what this verse actually means. This is the picture of what that verse says. The world to come has overlapped into our world, and right in the center where that overlap is, is where the kingdom of God is being manifested. Wherever the kingdom of God, the word of God is preached, there's a manifestation of the kingdom of God. But here's what has happened to us, and it's important that we see this. From the founding of our country forward, 1620, we came forth as a church as a people, a God-fearing people, and Christians came over here to start this country. There was not a lot of darkness. They came over believing God. They came over with their Bibles. The first buildings they built were churches, and the schools were in the churches. And so every, every little community they set up, they would first build a church. And the school would be in the church. And they taught students from the Bible. They taught them the word of the living God. And they gathered at the church. And when the harvest came in and they needed to dispense food, it came from the church. There was an overlap. But then look what happens to us. 1800, less than 200 years later, a lot of the light of that glory of that er, those early settlers has now disappeared and darkness is creeping into our country. It's sort of a, a slow process that's happening. And then we look and what happens in 1850 is we have this great awakening and behold the light begins to flood our country once again. And you can see all of this in the statistics of this country. You can see what's going on as you follow history. But then look what happens after 1850. In 1962, prayer is taken out of school because now the light is being pushed aside once again and the darkness is taking over. Prayer is taken out of school. We don't talk about Easter. We don't talk about Christmas. 
And you don't want to mention God or Jesus or you'll get some demerits or you could go to the principal's office. And then in 1963, abortion is legalized. And look at what's happening here. The light is beginning to fade from America and America is getting darker and darker and darker. And in the age in which we're living today, gay marriage, 2009, socialism, government control of business and industry, and we just have this slight overlap in this country. We are in danger of not being a Christian nation. And we need to wake up and understand what's going on here and let God hear from us as we cry and pray and believe God. So look what happened one more time. We start out here and the light of God almost totally covers our nation. And we come to this day right here where there's just a barely an overlap of the kingdom of God into our world. So the question is, what do we do about it? Now, we can come to church, and we can have worship services, and we can sing, and we can feel the presence of God. And gosh, my goodness, you had great singing up here. And I, I, I love the worship. I love the singing. It's, it's just in, incredible. But, but outside of our doors, the world's going to hell. Outside of our world, outside of our doors, there's demonic activity. Outside of our doors, there's transgenderism, there's gay marriage, there is drug addiction, there's alcohol addiction, there is all kind of sexual immorality and impurity. And, and somehow we need to wake up here and understand we have to do something about this. We can't live like this and lose our nation. We must wake up. We must become the people of God. We must take God out into the streets of our city. We must take God back into our schools. We, we must take back over the educational system. We must rise up. We must run for election on the school boards and the city council. And we must say, yes, the light is coming back into this country. And that's up to you and I. Someone as well said that we're so immersed in living that most of us have gotten forgotten what? Life is for. And so a lot of people are just living to live. They just get up every day and live on a day-by-day -day basis to live. And at some point, you got to understand that this life ends in death. That is what the Bible says. It is appointed unto man once to die. The question is, will you really live before you die? Or will you just exist? Will you live the fullness, the abundance that Jesus spoke of? Will you live your highest life in the kingdom and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? Will you tread upon scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy? Will you not be afraid to literally step into situations where darkness has come and bring the light of God and decree the glory of Jesus Christ in that life and speak the word of the living God? Life is what happens to us when we're getting ready to live. Your life is happening to you on a day-by-day -day basis month after month, year after year, and pretty soon life ebbs away. And what have we done with our life? We were not put here just for ourselves. We were put here for the kingdom of God. We got here with a destiny, a kingdom destiny. We have a kingdom purpose, and God has put a kingdom calling on our life, and we have kingdom gifts and anointings that we are to be blessing other people with. Life is not just about us. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about God taking back the people of the earth who are his people anyway, but the the devil has come in and usurped authority from the church, and now we are paying the price of the darkness. And we need to wake up and do something about it. Kingdom life is, is, is the highest possible life strategy. There is no strategy in the world. There is no, there are no teachings in the world like the red letter teachings of Jesus Christ. You could not believe in Jesus, you could not believe in God, you could not believe in the Bible, and live by the red-letter teachings and still live the highest life possible on this earth. Even if you didn't know Jesus, his teachings are so powerful. His teachings are so wonderful, so purifying, if you will. So the good news of the kingdom message is that all of God's power is available to us right now to do what? Break into our mundane, monotonous Christian living with victory and energy and passion like you can't believe. We should be more excited than the people are who root for the Cleveland Browns to win on Sunday. 
We should be more excited. We should get excited about God. We should come to church with excitement. We should come expecting miracles. We, we should say, God, I'm here for you to use me. Go right ahead. Give me a word of wisdom. Give me a word of knowledge. Show me something about somebody in this house that I can go and be a blessing. I'm sorry. I'm getting too excited here, but I, I, I just can't help it. You know, it's just amazing. It's amazing the power of God that's available to us. Demons are supposed to be subject to us. We should not be surrendering up our young people and our children to the powers of hell. We should take authority over the demon spirits of drugs and alcoholism and sexual immorality and sexual perversion and say to the devil, you will take my child over my dead body. According to his word, the supreme purpose of our life is to know Jesus and to be known by him. Known by him. To have Jesus know who we are. So the Christian life is to be an adventure. We're, we're to be on a journey, living an adventure, if you will. And it, it involves, I think, personally for me, the quest and the pursuit and the search for his kingdom, the quest, the pursuit, and the search for his kingdom. So listen to this, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Pray like this, manifest your kingdom realm, cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on the earth, just as it is in heaven. Now, the question for all of us is, do we really believe that? Those are the words of Jesus Christ. He said, I want you to pray for my kingdom to come. I want you to pray for my kingdom to come in Levittsburg. I want you to pray for my kingdom to come in the schools of Levittsburg. I want you to pray for my kingdom to come where the city council meet and, and, and the governor meets and, and, and all of the mayors and, and all of the people who serve in political. I, I want you to pray my kingdom to come there. I want you to walk through your neighborhoods and I want you to pray for the kingdom of God to come. I want you to walk down the streets and just pray for the presence of God. That when people pull into your neighborhood, the anointing of the Holy Spirit will be there. Don't look at me like this. Listen to me. We, we are living so far beneath the power that's been given to us by God. And we need to wake up and understand it. We should not let our families die and go to hell. There must be deliverance for our children and for our young people. Verse 33, so above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from him. You and I live in the world of doing. This, everybody's doing. It's a world of doing. But you see, the kingdom is the world of being. You are a kingdom subject, kingdom servant of the Most High God. You must get that through your head. You must get up in the morning and speak to yourself. I am a child of the living God. I am empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out into my world and bring the message of Jesus Christ. A few days ago, I was in the gym exercising. A good friend of mine was there. She works at the hospital. And she came over to where I was and she said, I, I really need you to pray because a young five-year-old girl was just brought to the hospital this week. She's paralyzed from the neck down. Her mother was drunk and had a wreck. And this is the aftermath of that wreck. And the doctors have told me that she will never walk again. I cried standing there in the gym. A five-year-old who did nothing wrong, nothing, but because of a sinful addiction to alcohol. She now is paralyzed from the neck down. I took the hands of my friend and we prayed standing in the gym because you see, I don't care where I'm at, it's church time. A lady said to me in the bank one day, you know, I need you to pray about something. I said, that's fine. Just put your hands under that little teller window there and hand them to me. And I started praying right there in the bank because, you see, that's God's bank. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And all they that dwell therein, he had founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. 
to wherever I'm at. It's church time, baby. If you want me to pray and, and about something, don't you just come up to me in public and ask me. I'm going to pray right there on the spot. I'm not going to yell and scream, but I'm going to pray, and I'm going to believe God. We backed up too much. We need to start moving forward, see. We need to become aggressive kingdom servants of God. Somebody say praise the Lord around here. We are eternal creatures, said out loud. I'm an eternal, eternal creature. Now, all that was pitiful. Say it out loud. I am an eternal creature. I will live somewhere forever. Ecclesiastes 3 and 11 says, God put eternity in our hearts. So we've lost the sense of eternal living while we're here on the earth. We're already eternal beings. We're not waiting for someday to be eternal beings. You are right now an eternal being. You have a sense of God inside of you. You have the seed of God inside of you. You are right now living eternity, and you will continue to live that. All of us are aware in this transient world that we're living of something more. You, you, know, you know, all of us are aware on any given day that there's more to life than what we got, correct? I mean, who in here has already arrived and you got everything you think you ever should have? No, nobody. There's got to be more. Somebody help me here. There's got to be more than what I have. There's got to be more. Than, and, and what is that sense of more? It's that sense of eternity that God put inside of us. And we have to draw closer and closer to him. We become, we, we become in covenant with the almighty God. It's kind of like Enoch experienced when he was in the Old Testament. And he was taking a walk one day and he loved God so much. And he and God had such fellowship that God just took him right off the face of the earth. That's the kind of fellowship God wants with you and I. He says, I, I want to fellowship with you. I want to be one with you in your life. I want to live your life with you and through you. I want to empower you by my spirit. Church and Christian living and serving and praying and all these songs and all these things we do about church. If you're not careful, it gets pretty monotonous if the Holy Spirit doesn't come and start transforming lives. God, I feel his presence in this place right now. Way back in the very beginning, God assigned the human job description. Here it is, right out of the book of Genesis. Come on, fast forward there with me. Get to the human job description. Get to the human job description. It says human job description. Should be on your nerve. PowerPoint there somewhere. We are, say we are, to collectively rule over all living things on earth, animal and plant. We are responsible before God for life on the earth. Now, I know you're going to look at me and say, where is that in the Bible? Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 through 30. We've been put in charge. You and I have been put in charge. If you are a born-again believer, you've been put in charge down here. Why don't you start acting like you're in charge, see? When the devil comes after your family, why don't you act like you're in charge? Why don't you act like God has appointed you to be the priest of your home? When the devil comes after your children, why don't you rise up and tell the devil, get your hands off my children, you can't have them. We've got to rise up in the power of the Holy Spirit. So the Bible says you and I have tasted of the power to come, the powers to come. We've already had a taste of it. God hasn't fully arrived with his kingdom on earth, but he's given us a taste. He's given us something inside of us. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Once people have seen the light, gotten a taste of heaven, and been part of the work of the Holy Spirit, once they've personally experienced the sheer goodness of God's word and the powers breaking in on us. If people in this town walked into this church on Sunday morning and the power of the Holy Spirit swept through this place, You wouldn't be begging anybody to come to church. I, a lady stopped me not too long ago in the gym. She said, are, are you a pastor? I said, I am. And, and, and she said, do you pastor the church on Australia? I said, I do. 
She said, can I just tell you something? I watch those services and then I go to my church. It's like 50 minutes and nothing happens. And I tune into your services and God is always working and moving and you're always telling us and showing us people that have been saved or healed or delivered or set free. And she said, I hunger for that so much. And I just looked her right in the eye, Pastor. I said, well, then maybe it's time you found a new church where the power is, where the glory is, where the anointing is, where the kingdom is being manifested, where the lives of people are being transformed by the spirit of the almighty God. Six things you ought to know about the kingdom, and I'll wrap this up. I don't want to keep you here all night. I know some of you are hungry. Perhaps. First of all, you can be near the kingdom. Say, I can be near the kingdom. Look at this. Jesus instructing the 70. Read with me. And heal the sick in it, the town, and say to them, the kingdom of God has come close to you. The kingdom has come close to you. Secondly, you can see the kingdom. You can see the kingdom. You can see, what, he, what does he say? You can see the manifestation of the kingdom. And you will know it's the kingdom because man can't do it. I, I, I was meeting a friend on Thursday morning for, for breakfast. He's a businessman. He's a multimillionaire. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, I, one of his... His son came by to see me. He said, we were talking about something. I said, oh, my dad told me to give you this. He doesn't even attend our church. I opened it as a $10,000 check. You need people like that. Hello? Hello? You can see the kingdom. So I went in to meet him on a Thursday morning. We'd been there two or three times, and same waitress. Her name was Carol. And if we didn't see Carol, we asked for her. Everybody wants to sit in Carol's place. And so Carol came out, and I said, Carol, how are you? She said, I'm fine. How are you? I said, I'm good. Carol, where do you go to church? Oh, she said, well, we... We used to go. I said, I didn't ask you where you used to go. Where do you go now? Well, she said, we're, we, we haven't been for a while, but we're going to go. I didn't even know this, but she went back in the back. She said, that's the second time he's asked me that, and I wish he would just shut up. <laughs> it's just none of his business if I go to church or not. So the next week, when I, I didn't know any of this till later. And next week, I came and I said, Carol, Carol, please, I didn't see you this weekend. It broke my heart because I thought you said you were going to come. Well, we're going to come. I, I told you we're going to come. My husband and I are going to come. It took three or four weeks, and she showed up with her husband on a Sunday morning. And Jesus Christ touched their heart. And they rededicated their lives to Jesus. Three months later, he got sick. Five months later, he was dead. Dead. And I go back to that, and I think to myself, oh, God, what if I hadn't said something? What if I hadn't invited them to church? Right. So I did, I'd gone to the hospital, visited him several times. Then I did the funeral. And I looked at Carol when it was all over, and I said, Carol, you, you, you must live your faith. Oh, don't worry, Pastor, I'll be there. I'll be there. Every week she comes. About the third week, she brought two people with her. Fourth week, she brought those two and two more. Last count, she's brought about 25. Over half of them had gotten saved by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Glory. When, when Cracker Barrel came out with their rainbow rockers, we all stopped eating there. I'm sure all y'all did too, because 
Yeah, absolutely. And so Carol went to another restaurant. And she kept coming to church, and she started talking to the waitresses. And there was a waitress there that was going to kill herself almost with alcohol, just drinking every weekend. Beautiful girl named Olivia. I just had a counseling session with Olivia on Wednesday night. And Olivia started coming, and about the third or fourth time she came, she gave her heart to Jesus. Her life was totally transformed. She didn't need rehab, even though she'd been drinking for years. She was in the house when her boyfriend killed himself. And the trauma of it had just so totally destroyed her. She was trying to drown her sorrows and her fears with alcohol. And God delivered her. And she sat there. She's working in our nursery now. She loves the little children. She's working in our nursery now. Carol is like an, an evangelist. People come to work at Loma Linda's, you know, Loma Linda's in Toledo where she works. And, and, if, and if you're around Carol, you're either going to get saved or you're going to try to hide from her because that's just who <laughs> Carol is. She sing the kingdom. Her husband went to heaven because she saw the kingdom. I mean, what on earth is wrong with us? What about the waitress who waits on you? What about the person that handles your business at the bank? Has a cat got your tongue? As my grandmother used to say, you can't speak. I mean, what's wrong with us? This is crazy. There should not be empty seats in a church. If you knew how close we were to the coming of Jesus Christ, you would be going after your family. Oh, they don't like for me to talk to them. Do it anyway. Do it anyway. Amen. You can see the kingdom. Number three, you can enter the kingdom. Look at this. Read it. Unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. If you're born of the water and the spirit, you can enter the kingdom. You can step into the kingdom here on the earth. Yes. Number four, look at this. Or five, I don't know where we were. You can receive the kingdom. It is your father's good pleasure too. Would you like to have a gift tonight? Would you like to receive a gift from the Father? Do you want a gift from God? It is my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What is he talking about? Say, I'm going to give you the power, the authority, and the glory, the same message my son preached. I'm going to give you the same word that came from my son. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus, you can receive the kingdom. Next. You can possess the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven has endured violent assault. See those words, violent assault, and violent men seize it by forth. I looked at this verse for years, and I just couldn't grasp it. I, I, when I was at Lee University, Dr. Arrington was my Greek teacher. He's, one of the, he's probably one of the top five Greek scholars in the world. He's 93 years of age now, still sharp as he can possibly be. Anytime I struggled with a verse, I'd call Dr. Arrington. I said, I, I, I don't understand this. What is this violent thing? Violent assault. Violent men seize it by force. And I started looking at the Greek word. It's, it's the word bios in the Greek from which we get our word science. The science of life. And I suddenly saw it. He said, the kingdom of God is such a mighty force that it comes upon us with such force that it seizes us. And I thought, i got to have a picture of this, and I found it. In my neighborhood, we lived in old homes. We were poor. Poor people called us poor. I lived on the mill village. We didn't have anything. We didn't even have a car for many years. We had to... Bum rides from everybody. My dad was an alcoholic. Five children, my mother, my dad, seven of us, four-room houses mostly. We lived in those neighborhoods, those old neighborhoods. The concrete had been down for 50, 60 years. And you'd ride down the street, and you'd come to a piece of concrete that had popped up about two inches. If you didn't watch it, you'd, you'd trip over it. We, we used to run over it with our skates when it get up so high, and you get that little zip and that jump. And the root that came from the tree that pushed that four-inch, four-by-four 
slab of concrete probably weighed 10 pounds and you got 1,000 pounds of concrete. So why could that root so small lift that concrete? Because life was in that root. Life. And that's the kingdom. When the kingdom life comes upon you, men can't resist the words that you speak. Glory to God. I'm about to run the aisles. I don't know if y'all do that here or not. I'm sorry. I'll get a little more dignified here in a moment. And the last one, you can be possessed by the kingdom. The kingdom of God is within you. Release it. Just go release it. Stand up with me, please. John chapter 3 and verse 5, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. His ability is never limited by your inability when you're a kingdom subject. Jesus did three things when he was upon the earth concerning his kingdom. It's right there in the Gospels. First of all, he proclaimed the availability of his kingdom to everyone. Let's come back to Mark 1 and 15 in the literal translation. Read it out loud. All the preliminaries have been taken care of, he said, and the rule of God is now accessible to who? Everyone. The rule of God is accessible to who? Everyone. Look at someone and say, everyone means you. <sighs> Read on. Review your plans for living and base your life on this remarkable new opportunity. Base your life on this kingdom. God, I feel his presence in this place. Secondly, he taught the message of the kingdom. I must preach the good news, the gospel of the kingdom to the other cities and towns also, for I was sent for this purpose. Thirdly, he manifested his kingdom presence in a way that could only be explained supernaturally. Your challenges in your life should never limit you. You should limit your challenges by manifesting kingdom power. Kingdom authority, kingdom glory. I have a friend who lives down in Alabama. He lives in a little small town of about 2,000 people. It's out in the boondocks, out in the middle of nowhere. He's running 5,000. Only 2,000 people live in the town. He's running 5,000. He got a kingdom mindset. What Levittsburg, is this Life Church? Is this what you call it? Life Church at Levittsburg. What Life Church needs is a bunch of people who are full of the kingdom of God. Do you want to be possessed by the kingdom? Do you, do, you, uh, do you want to possess it and do you want to be possessed by it? I, I just want to know. I just, I just drove over here tonight to ask you that question. Do you want to be possessed by the kingdom? Do you want the power of God to flow through your life? Are you willing to go out in your world and speak up for Jesus Christ? We have four years here where God has held back his wrath on this country. God had every reason to smack us down. But he gave us a four-year reprieve. It's very possible with J.D. Vance we could get 12 years. 12 is the number of government in the Bible. I'm a kingdom person. I look at everything from a kingdom perspective. Jesus only had one message. I only have one.
message. It's the kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. Are you ready to live a kingdom life? I mean, I'm serious. Are you ready to live a kingdom life? Then I want you to get out of your seats and walk up here to this front and fill up this altar. I, Pastor, I want to live the kingdom life. I want a kingdom anointing on my life. I am not ashamed of the kingdom of God. Come in close. Come in close. Come in close, please. Just come in Jesus' name. I want you to look at me and I want you to listen to me, please. Covenant is the way God runs his kingdom. Covenant. It's an old covenant and a new covenant. The kingdom of God has laws. One of the reasons I wrote this book is because people don't really understand the kingdom. The kingdom of God is run by laws, governed by laws. God does not run his kingdom on emotion. He runs his kingdom on laws, unchangeable laws. You look up the universe, you will see the kingdom of God. Those planets stay in their orbit because of the laws of the kingdom. And they don't deviate. Science tells us if, 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 the, if, if the earth moves three inches closer to the sun, we'll all burn up. If it moves three inches further away, then we'll all freeze to death. That's God's law governing the sun. At some point, Pastor, the church must decide to be ruled by the kingdom. Kingdom law. When Jesus came, he gave us the kingdom constitution with all the red letter teachings, all the words that he spoke. Love is a law in the kingdom. Forgiveness is a law in the kingdom. Now listen to me. Please listen to me. I'm just dealing with a couple right now, and he committed adultery, and she should have kicked his butt to the curb. But for the mercy of God. But for the mercy of God. And she just said to him, you know what? I'll forgive you, but I'm not going to live with you. Well, that's not forgiveness, you see. You have to practice forgiveness like God practices forgiveness. When God practices forgiveness, when he forgives you, he cancels your sin. It doesn't exist anymore. Now listen to this. Jesus had the audacity to say, if you do not forgive your brother, I will not forgive you. And the first time I ever read that, I thought to myself, there is something wrong with that translation. God has no choice but to forgive us. Oh, but he does. Forgiveness is a law. And if you violate the law and you don't observe and live by the law, the law doesn't work for you. Mark. Mark says you come to the altar and you offer your gift of worship at the altar. And you remember that you have ought in your heart against someone. You leave your gift of worship at the altar and you go and make things right. And then you come back and you offer me your worship. Now I can do that. I didn't have any problem with that one. I'm good with that, God. Oh, it's the next one that really kills me. You come to the altar and you want to offer your gift of worship. And you remember that your brother has something against you, your sister. You leave the altar. You leave. Don't you worship me until you go and give that individual the opportunity so that the two of you can make things right. And I said to God, I'm not guilty. I didn't do anything to them. Oh, but he said, you're my son. You're my child. And you must go and offer them the opportunity that as far as it depends on you, you will be at peace with all people. If they reject you, you can come on back and worship freely. Boy, it's tough, isn't it? We got people sitting on our pews in church. You have them right here in this church. And you have ought against your brother or your sister. You're holding feelings. You're angry. You're upset. You're not going to have a move of God with that kind of stuff going on. See, you got to bow at the feet of Jesus. If you don't forgive your brother, I will not forgive you. 
Whoa, God. Don't you want a move of God in your town? Don't you want the fire of the Holy Spirit to sweep through this town? Don't you want to see blinded eyes open, deaf ears unstopped? Don't you want to see the lame walk? Don't you want to see those miracles? When my wife went to heaven on August the 18th, 2020 at 4.05 a.m. in the morning, my world stopped. For months, the enemy laughed at me because I've seen people healed of cancer. I was in a funeral home in Toledo, Ohio, and a lady walked up to me and she said, do you remember me? I said, I don't, I'm so sorry. Well, she said, my name is Grace. You remember the time you walked into Toledo Hospital? You'd only been in Toledo about two years. And you came in to the hospital and I was in that old section, one of those small rooms. And you walked into my room and I was asleep and I heard something and I, I was startled. But I wasn't startled because someone was walking into my room. When you came walking towards my bed, there was an angel over your head. And when you reached down to pray for me, the reason I drew back is the angel reached to touch me. I was supposed to be dead within six months. It's been six years. I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to tell you the kingdom works. And if it doesn't work, we should stop preaching it. But it does work. The problem is not with the kingdom. The problem's with us. And so when my wife went to heaven, I, I, I said to God, I'm having a tough time praying for people with cancer now, you know. I just couldn't do it. I had, I had problems praying for anybody to get a miracle because we didn't get the miracle. I couldn't understand it. Shirley, Shirley was one of the most unusual saints of God that ever walked on this earth. She loved everybody. She made everybody feel loved. She never met a stranger. She could look you in the eye and reprimand you for your behavior, and you would cry and love her for doing it. Most amazing gift I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen anybody like her. suddenly she was gone it just took all the life out of me I said to God I might as well hang it up and then one day God got a hold of me and jerked my chain he said you better look at your daughter and your son and your four granddaughters and they're watching how you handle this And I've already placed my calling on your daughter and her two daughters. And you better line up with my assignment. You better get in alignment here. My daughter Melanie is my co-pastor now. Her oldest daughter Olivia is a missionary in Manchester, England right now for one year. The younger daughter is Mackenzie. She's in her second year at the Ramp University down in Hamilton, Alabama. She's a firebrand, powerful, been studying the Bible since she was eight years old, getting up early every morning to pray at 6 a.m. I could have messed it up. But I took it to the altar. I will never get over it but I will get through it. See? So I want you to make a covenant with God in this house to live kingdom lives. I, I, I pray, Pastor, that you'll teach this book to your church. I really do. I, I humbly ask you to consider that. Raise your right hand to heaven and say, Lord God, I believe how you taught me to pray. To seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. To pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In my life, 
in my family, my marriage, in this church. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I give you me, Father. I'm a kingdom person. I'm going to live a kingdom life. I'm going to tread on those serpents and scorpions. I'm going to exercise authority over all the powers of hell. And nothing is going to hurt me. In Jesus' name I pray. Now lift your other hand up and praise God. Praise Him for the covenant. The mighty covenant of the mighty God. When my wife went to heaven, I, I can tell you for sure, I didn't know a lot about heaven. I knew it was there. Streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl. I knew all those stuff, but I didn't know what was going on there. And I, I, people sent me books. I just put them on the shelf. I wouldn't even read them. I said, God, I want you to tell me in your word where my wife is and what she's doing. I want to know. I cried, I prayed, I begged God, speak to me. Four months I studied heaven. Four months, 16 messages on heaven. I saw things about heaven I never knew before. I saw what was going on in heaven. I saw Moses and Elijah appear on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Jesus came. Peter, James, and John knew exactly who they were. Why? The word of knowledge by the Holy Spirit. What did they talk about? They were discussing with Jesus, the Bible said, what remained for him to do on the earth. So they're very knowledgeable of what's going on down here. Oh, that set my soul on fire. That's when I made a decision, Valerie. I said, I can never marry again because she's up there watching me. She wouldn't approve. She's not going to like it. So I'm, I still got the wedding band on that she gave me. I'm not upsetting her up there in heaven. I tell you that right now. When I get there, I want to find her. I want to talk to her. I made it so hard for God about me getting married. I said, God, you'd have to drop somebody on my front porch that said, I have come from God out of heaven to be your wife. <laughs> I've had some proposals already. I'm not interested. A lady came to our church. True story. Multi-millionaire. Gave the church several million dollars. And then one day she told somebody, I'm supposed to have a relationship with the pastor. I said, I'm sorry. I had to call her in, look her in the eye. That's not going to happen. So she took her money and left. I'm serious about this thing. I belong to God. I'm yours, Lord. All the way, I give you me. See? I just want to see this nation rise back up. I want to see the church of God come back to the place that we are firebrands. Firebrands. If I don't stop right now, I won't quit. But what I did was I took all those 60 messages on heaven, things I guarantee you, you've never heard preached. And I put them on, what do you call it, a thumbnail, thumb drive, thumb drive. So you put it into your computer and you can listen to all six. And there's another, I don't even know how many messages are on the kingdom when some stuff in the book, a lot of stuff not in the book on the thumb, thumb drive, thumb drive. Sometimes they send people with me because I'm not real smart about technology and nobody wanted to come on Friday night, so I'm here by myself. God, don't ever let this church be the same. Send fire. Send fire from heaven. And to Pastor Rodney and Pastor Valerie, send fire.
and he stands in this pulpit on Sunday, let fire fill his soul, God, in Jesus' name. ago Val was in Toledo with her mother helping her clean out some closets and things I was in the home, the house by myself and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said take authority over your home and I don't tell many people this but for the last 10 years, every Saturday night, preparing for the service, I am attacked. It's like hell is unleashed against me. While I was walking through my house praying, God said to my heart through the Holy Spirit, I didn't tell you to pray. I told you to take authority over this house. And I, put, I reached my hand over toward the front doors and I said, Satan, you are not welcome here. Your battle, your fight, it ends tonight. I walked through that house and just took authority over the enemy. Because that is a place where God gives me rest and restoration. And the enemy tried. I'm telling you, this is a revelation that we received tonight. If you can lock into this, I've already been reading through the book. I received it at our minister's meeting. Pastors, receive this, man. Church, receive this. <laughs> We can change our world around us when we're possessed with the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Have you enjoyed this word tonight? Have you enjoyed this word tonight?